Hello, my name is Jeremy, and this is the True Crime Chronicles channel. Do good, and you'll receive evil, declares a familiar proverb. From an early age, we were instructed to act kindly and assist those in our vicinity. Regrettably, at times, benevolent actions towards others may result in irreversible outcomes. Megan Newton, born in 2001 to Michael and Sarah, also had a stepsister named Demi. However, Megan primarily spent her time alongside her mother, Sarah, forging an incredibly tight-knit bond akin to best friends. Megan kept no secrets from her mother, while Sarah, in return, would often consult her daughter, who displayed wisdom beyond her years on various significant issues. The woman characterized her daughter as highly ambitious, dynamic, and affable. Megan's friends described her as someone with an excellent sense of humor, compassionate and thoughtful whereas her grandparents remarked that she possessed a golden heart. From a young age, she was always prepared to lend a hand to others. In her elementary school days, Megan encountered a new classmate, a girl whose family had recently relocated to England from China. The girl faced significant challenges in understanding the curriculum and interacting with peers due to her lack of English proficiency. Consequently, the teacher placed her beside Newton, hoping the compassionate and helpful Megan would assist the newcomer. Megan embraced this role wholeheartedly, overcoming the language barrier to aid her classmate in adjusting to a new environment. By the time the girl moved back to China, she had achieved a respectable level of English proficiency. Megan's kindness and open-mindedness persisted into her teenage years and adulthood, finding expression in her passion for sports. Soccer, in particular, captured her heart, leading her to join the Stoke-on-Trent women's soccer team. Additionally, she engaged in coaching, dedicating her weekends to training young girls under seven years old instead of resting. Striving for her level one coaching badge, Megan aspired to secure a sports scholarship in the USA. Her commitment to sports, especially soccer, was so profound that she chose to pursue a career in it, even getting a small tattoo of a soccer cleat to express her love for the game. Upon completing her schooling, Megan embarked on her college journey aiming to pursue a career as a sports therapist or physiotherapist. This milestone was particularly thrilling because she was the inaugural member of her family to attend a tertiary education institution. Megan Newton was a gifted and appealing young student, brimming with potential and poised for a bright future. Regrettably, her prospects and dreams were cut short by a tragic incident in the spring of 2019. Newton balanced her time between three part-time jobs. For the 18-year-old, Friday, April 19th, started as a typical day, with no forewarning of what was to come. She wrapped up her shift at a local fish and chips shop and made her way home around 10.20 p.m. By this point, Megan was living independently from her family, who endorsed her autonomy, confident in her judicious planning and decision-making. She had moved into her own apartment in a high-rise on Fletcher Road, embracing the solitude and added responsibilities that came with it. After changing, applying makeup, and styling her hair, Megan set off to enjoy a night out with friends. They hit a nightclub in Hanley, spent the night dancing, indulging in a few drinks, and reveling in the joy of the moment, with Megan beaming throughout. In the early hours of Saturday, just before 3 a.m., Megan, accompanied by a friend and a young man, took a taxi back. It seemed she had returned safely to her apartment to rest. However, the reality was tragically different. The following morning, just after dawn, a neighbor discovered a set of keys near the building, marked with what appeared to be blood. These were handed over to a housing complex worker who, upon noticing blood splatters, decided to check on the apartment's occupant. Entering the apartment with the neighbor, they were met with a chilling sight. Megan's naked and bloodied body was found on the bed, face down, having been stabbed multiple times with a kitchen knife that was found close by. This gruesome discovery would forever scar the neighbors, who remembered Megan as a vibrant, resilient, and exceptionally charming young woman. The apartment paperwork and IDs confirmed the identity of the deceased as Megan Newton, unmistakably the young woman who had been violently slain in her own bedroom. Police, upon arrival, promptly notified Megan's family, who were then faced with the harrowing ordeal of identifying their daughter at the morgue. This was a daughter they had nurtured with immense love and had only recently given the independence to live by herself never envisioning such a catastrophic end in their most horrifying nightmares. The crime scene was immediately sealed off, and forensic experts were dispatched to Megan's apartment to gather any possible clues. 
the autopsy disclosed the gruesome extent of the assault Megan had suffered. It was found that she was first strangled, losing consciousness due to restricted airways, followed by receiving nine stab wounds to her back, which punctured both lungs. Additionally, it was evident that she had been sexually assaulted. The murder weapon, a kitchen knife that belonged to Megan, was located in the vicinity. The forensic pathologist determined that it was these knife wounds that ultimately led to Megan Newton's premature demise. The blood-stained knife and apartment keys were dispatched to the lab, with the hope that forensic analysis could reveal the assailant's DNA. It was hypothesized that the criminal had accidentally dropped the keys while exiting Megan's apartment post-murder. The investigation commenced with detectives piecing together the sequence of events leading up to the tragic incident. Through discussions with Megan's acquaintances and relatives, it was ascertained that she had spent the evening at a club before, hailing a taxi home in the wee hours. The investigative team scoured surveillance footage from the vicinity of the nightclub and the path Megan took home in an effort to trace her final movements and possibly pinpoint the assailant. Their attention was drawn to footage showing Megan boarding a taxi, accompanied by a friend and an unidentified young man, raising questions about this individual's identity and potential role in the crime. Subsequent video from within Megan's apartment complex showed this same young man again, this time within the premises. Luckily, a camera positioned in the common hallway offered a clear view of the entrance to Megan's apartment, allowing officers to monitor who came and went that night. The goal was to identify the murderer by scrutinizing the video recordings from the evening of the incident. At approximately 3.44 a.m., Megan was seen entering her apartment building's lobby with the same young man she had shared a taxi ride with around an hour before. They proceeded together towards her apartment, with Megan appearing cheerful and exhibiting no signs of apprehension or unease around the individual. Upon reaching her door, Megan used her keys to unlock it, and they both went inside. However, a particular moment caught the detective's attention. While Megan was unlocking the door, the young man stood behind her, scanning the area and even making eye contact with the camera lens at one point. This behavior immediately raised suspicions among the police. They pondered whether the young man had premeditated harming Megan, possibly after coercing her into sexual acts, and was checking for potential witnesses. Further scrutiny of the video footage from the remainder of the night revealed a disturbing fact. Only the young man exited the apartment the following morning. Around 5.54 a.m. he attempted to leave the building but realized he needed a special key fob to do so. He returned to Megan's apartment momentarily, retrieved the keys, and eventually managed to exit the building. The external surveillance captured him discarding an object where the blood-stained apartment keys would later be discovered by a neighbor. The most damning evidence of his involvement in Megan's death was obtained from another surveillance camera, which showed him walking away from the scene inspecting one of his hands that appeared to be covered in blood. This critical piece of evidence marked a pivotal moment in the investigation. Identifying the young man as Joseph Trevor was swift due to a recent run-in with the law. Just the day before the tragic event, he had been arrested for possessing ketamine, a substance used both medically and in veterinary settings as an anesthetic and sometimes for pain management. The police officer who had apprehended Trevor immediately recognized him in the surveillance footage. Trevor, 18, hailed from a reputable family deeply rooted in the law enforcement community, with both his father and mother serving as police officers. He resided in a neighboring district and had a long-standing acquaintance with Megan Newton, as they had been high school classmates. Joseph led a seemingly typical life. He was academically successful and shared Megan's passion for sports excelling in soccer to the extent of playing semi-professionally for Newcastle Town and securing a sports scholarship in America, with plans to relocate there after completing his studies. Like Megan, Joseph was pursuing higher education in Newcastle, poised for a promising future. To many who knew him, Trevor was perceived as a kind, affable, and sociable individual. Yet, he harbored a less visible, volatile side to his character, capable of shifting from a jovial and engaging demeanor to one that was reclusive, brusque, and abrupt without any discernible trigger. This unpredictability left acquaintances unsure of which version of Joseph they would encounter on any given day. When the detectives in the Megan Newton case began to look more closely at Trevor's background, they came across some very unpleasant information about his past. Approximately three years earlier, at age 15, was suspected of abusing another teenage girl. Because the attempt at intimate contact failed, he was not charged or punished. However, Everyone around the school knew about the incident. 
After this incident, classmates at the school began to call Trevor a predator and child molester, since the public arrest at the school could not go unnoticed. Now for the police, this information became a warning because Megan was also subjected to forced sexual intercourse that night. Joseph Trevor was identified as the primary suspect in the assault case. Investigators focused on his movements that night. They already knew from surveillance footage that he was near the nightclub and got into the same taxi as Megan, later heading to her apartment with her. But what he did before that moment and why he ultimately went to Newton's home was unclear. Detectives discovered that Joseph Trevor was also at a party with his school friends the previous evening. In fact, he and his friends ended up in the same bar as Newton by chance, and since they all knew each other from school, they simply greeted each other and continued to enjoy their time separately. However, Joseph didn't spend much time in the nightclub. The security noticed he had a packet of white powder with him. Therefore, they simply put him out on the street and called the police. The squad that reached the location detained the young man and escorted him to the nearby police department. It might have been known to the officers that his parents were also members of the law enforcement community. Yet Trevor faced no legal repercussions. Instead, they unlocked his cuffs, seized the ketamine, and let him go, advising him to return home and refrain from further illicit drug use. Contrary to their advice, Joseph didn't head home. He went straight back to the club where Megan was. Predictably, entry was denied to him, and close to 2.40 a.m., after Megan exited the establishment, she ran into her old school peer by the taxi queue. Trevor shared his recent ordeal at the police station with Megan, voicing his concern about facing his parents due to his excessive drinking. Given that his parents were cops, they were probably already informed of his apprehension for illegal drug possession. Overwhelmed and uncertain, the young man was at a loss for what to do next. Megan, always compassionate and eager to assist, allowed Joseph Trevor to borrow her phone to try and contact a friend. Unfortunately, he couldn't secure a place to stay for the night. Witnessing the disarray in her tipsy former classmate's demeanor, and being the altruistic and observant person she was, consistently eager to lend a hand in challenging times, Megan invited Joseph to crash on her living room sofa. Come morning, once sober, he could decide on his approach with his parents. Trevor gratefully agreed to the proposition, which explains why surveillance footage captured him entering a cab with Megan and her companion. En route, Joseph messaged his dad, falsely claiming he'd spend the night at a buddy's place. The cab first dropped Megan's companion off at her address before proceeding to take the pair to the apartment complex on Fletcher Road. It was there the duo was recorded by surveillance as they entered the building, and later, as Trevor exited, discarding the stained keys in the yard. The authorities were convinced that in those few hours, Joseph violently assaulted his schoolmate, leading to her tragic demise. He was left with no plausible way to dispute the accusations. The evidence unequivocally implicated him, with law enforcement prepared to apprehend him. Astonishingly, Joseph Trevor's parents were already informed by their son about his role in Megan Newton's untimely death. After departing from the apartment just before dawn, he made his way to a bridge over the A500 in Stoke-on-Trent. Climbing onto the barrier, he sat with his legs hanging over, gazing at the roadway beneath. It appeared he was considering leaping, overwhelmed by his actions against Megan and the imminent reality of his capture. Perhaps he sought an escape from facing the repercussions of his deed, contemplating ending his life definitively. Additionally, it was revealed that Joseph Trevor had a history of depression and prior suicide attempts. He had been spotted on this bridge previously. As Joseph deliberated over life's purpose once more, a bystander took note of him. This individual did not overlook the situation and promptly alerted the authorities about a man on the bridge seemingly in a suicidal state. Upon their arrival, Trevor was swiftly transported to the hospital for a psychiatric assessment. Following the evaluation, medical professionals determined it was safe for him to be discharged, and he went back to his residence under the watchful eye of his father. Back in his own space, he divulged the entire truth to his mother. Joseph found himself unable to withhold the burden any longer, conscious of the inevitable consequences of his deeds. After gathering his thoughts, he reached out to his mother via owning up to his role in Megan Newton's demise with the simple admission, I did something bad. He extended these confessions to a few of his friends as well, seemingly compelled by guilt or other emotions to disclose actions that couldn't be reversed. Upon receiving her son's admission, Joseph's mother wasted no time in contacting the authorities to relay his confession. By this point, however, 
the investigative team had already pinpointed Joseph Trevor as their prime suspect through footage from surveillance cameras, and were in the midst of coordinating his apprehension. The young individual was escorted to the police department for an interrogation, where he admitted to aspects of the offense. Specifically, he acknowledged being present at Megan's residence that evening, but was at a loss to detail the execution of the audacious assault. His narrative was consistent with surveillance footage showing their entry into her apartment. Generously, she offered him the couch for the night to avoid confronting his parents in his unkempt state. Trevor asserted that their physical interaction was consensual, and following their intimacy, he experienced a blackout. His recollection of subsequent events was non-existent. Essentially, Joseph didn't refute the assault on the woman, but the specifics of the incident and what drove him to such measures remained unclear to him. This portrayal aimed to distance him from the image of a deliberate, unfeeling aggressor, suggesting he shouldn't be fully accountable for his deeds. The sole memory he held onto from that night was Megan's apology. At 15, when Trevor faced allegations of harassing a peer, he was derided by his classmates who labeled him with various derogatory terms. Some branded him a predator and charmer, and among them, Newton allegedly tagged him as Rolf Harris, by Trevor's account. Rolf Harris, a famed Australian TV host, musician, and painter, was convicted of child abuse and other sexual offenses. These monikers deeply wounded Joseph throughout his youth, and he endeavored to erase these bitter memories over time. However, Megan's apology for the schoolyard taunts abruptly revived these painful recollections, propelling him into a fit of anger. In that instant, he purportedly seized a knife. Nonetheless, the detectives dismissed his account, skeptical of his conveniently lapsing memory at a pivotal juncture. The law enforcement officers were persuaded that he was fully cognizant of his actions throughout. It's likely that Megan merely turned him away that evening. She offered him a place to stay out of friendship, recognizing his troublesome situation. Having known each other for years, attending the same school and now the same college, they shared numerous interests and aspirations for the future. Their mutual enthusiasm for soccer might have led her to believe it was safe to share her space with him overnight. Upon his return to the apartment, Joseph attempted to escalate their interaction to a more intimate level. But Megan was not receptive and declined, which deeply frustrated Trevor, especially under the influence of alcohol and drugs. Disregarding her objections, he chose to use force. In an effort to eliminate the risk of her reporting the incident, he decided to take drastic measures to ensure her silence permanently. Shortly after Megan Newton's tragic passing, Joseph Trevor faced charges for intentionally ending the life of his fellow student along with committing two acts of sexual violence. The assault was discovered to have occurred in a manner involving multiple attacks. He was apprehended at his residence, and after several months, the legal proceedings commenced. Despite his initial partial admission, Joseph opted not to admit guilt, later altering his claim to acknowledge causing Megan's demise but insisting on consensual relations that night. He clung to this assertion until the trial's outset. On February 17, 2020, as the trial began, he abruptly shifted his plea to guilty on all counts, presumably to avoid the trial process, anticipating the jury's quick dismissal of his defense. Consequently, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, with eligibility for parole after a minimum of 21 years and 65 days. The courtroom witnessed a startling moment when Trevor, at his sentencing's conclusion, turned towards Sarah, Megan's mother, and silently mouthed, sorry. This gesture deeply infuriated her. The apologies, now meaningless, could not amend the past nor alleviate the prolonged distress Megan's family endured awaiting the trial. His late apology appeared as a further insult to the grieving mother. No apology could restore Sarah's daughter or negate Joseph's heinous actions that evening. The indifference Trevor displayed in the surveillance footage post-incident, as he left Megan's residence, underscored a lack of remorse for the irreversible harm inflicted on Megan and her family, robbing them of future joys and milestones, leaving them with a lifelong burden of sorrow. Megan's closest companion, Ricardo Eccles, revealed that they had plans to shop in Manchester the day following her passing. He was heartbroken upon learning of his friend's sudden loss. The news left him incredulous and in a state of shock for multiple days. However, in honor of Megan, he composed himself and initiated a fundraising effort to assist with the Newton family's funeral costs. He successfully collected several thousand British pounds, 
which were then given to her mother. Megan was always a pillar of support for those in distress, and now it was time for them to reciprocate, providing emotional support and assistance to her family and everyone who cherished her. In her brief yet impactful life, Megan was a fervent supporter of the Stoke City Football Club. During a game, the team's passionate supporters and players dedicated a minute of applause in remembrance of the departed young woman. Her family and friends gathered funds to set up a commemorative bench in Megan Newton's honor in a serene park in Stoke-on-Trent. This bench, overlooking a scenic pond and a playground suitable for football. If you liked this story, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. Don't forget to like and share your opinion in the comments. This is Jeremy. See you in the next video.